Howdy, howdy, folks. Once again, it's Donna here coming at you with another Linux security report. The third day in a row, and again, I did not expect to have to do another one this soon, but the Linux security news just keeps on rolling in, so I'll just keep on rolling it out to y'all. So anyway, the first one here at ZDNet.com, there's a Linux-powered car in your future, and the article talks about how a whole bunch of the world's auto manufacturers are getting together and they're just trying to come up with a common free open source way based on Linux to have a common software base that runs all cars on the road instead of doing it like they're doing now where each automotive company has a different uh, set of software, uh, of proprietary software that runs their own cars. So they're just trying to do it like this in order to make things more standardized and to cut their development costs. Now, what does this have to do with security? Well, it's just that uh, I don't remember how long ago it was, a year or two, I guess. Wired.com, the Wired magazine, did an article about how one of their reporters was uh, got talked into doing something very dangerous by a couple of security researchers. And these security researcher guys found out that they could get on a laptop and they could just surf on the internet, the, the search on the internet, and find these newer vehicles that are connected up to the internet. Because, you know, these new cars with all this... Uh, infotainment systems and all that, they're connected to the internet. So these guys found out that they could go and search for a particular vehicle on the internet and they could hack into its infotainment system and from there they could jump into actual the actual control mechanisms, the control programs for the vehicle itself. So this guy from Wired Magazine, in order to do his write-up, he let those guys do a demo by actually putting him on the road with the Jeep Cherokee and they hacked into it from their laptop. They took control of his brakes, his acceleration, steering. They took control of that whole vehicle. So for that reason, you can call me a Ludite if you want to. I don't care. I am sticking with my 96 Plymouth Breeze and my 90 Dodge Ram pickup truck, which don't have all that stuff. And let me tell you, if it weren't for the fact that the federally mandated ethanol-laced gasoline screwed up the carburetor on my 58 Edsel, I'd still be driving that too, okay? So, <laughs> so uh, this, I have to tell you, until they get the security figured out on the new vehicles, uh, I'm just going to stick to my old ones. And, well, really, I never drive anywhere anyway. You know, I work from home, so it's... Not like I have a whole big incentive to go out and buy a new car. Anyway, that aside, let's go over here. And this is the, really the big news of the day. Insane black hats behind world's most expensive ransomware forget to back up crypto keys. And only Linux victims can decrypt the warped $247,000 black energy module. And then only maybe. And so what this is about is about something called the kill disk disk wiping malware which among other things nuked some computers in the Ukrainian energy utilities and it's now being used in possibly the world's most expensive rat ransom attacks so the attackers are targeting Windows and Linux desktops and servers and are demanding a laughable 222 bitcoins which right now is the equivalent of about $247,000 for the data to be returned. No one has paid, even for victims laden with cash, since the attackers, oh, no one has paid, and this is a good thing, because since the attackers cannot decrypt the files, because the encryption keys are not saved locally or transmitted to command and control servers. Oops, doesn't do much good to have ransomware if you can't, deliver the files back after you've been paid. It kind of kills your credibility, guys. Come on now. So anyway, uh, 
So let us emphasize that the cyber criminals behind this kill disk variant cannot supply their victims with the decryption keys to recover their files despite those victims paying the extremely large sum demanded by this ransomware. And the malware was first a module employed in the 2015 attacks against Ukraine's energy facilities and it is, it is distributed through phishing, the tactic used by its suspected Russian authors and is capable of wrecking thousands of different file types and uh, and the phishing, uh, that's something, you know, I, I know, you know, when you're running Linux, I mean, for a long time, you know, people are really smug, you know, the, the Linux guys are just really smug. Oh, our security is so much better. Well, yeah, in a way it is, right? Uh, because, you know, we Linux users aren't uh, subject to the types of virus attacks that Windows users have to put up with. But still, there is a danger. There is such a thing as malware for Linux. And in this case, I mean, you don't even necessarily have to give the attackers root user privileges in order to do damage. I mean, if you've got a bunch of important files in your own home directory, then, you know, uh, you can download a piece of malware and it can run with just normal user privileges and just totally totally lock up those files in your own home directory. So, uh, yeah, uh, some bad stuff there, right? But, uh, so basically, you know, that's just, you know, to, to be able to combat something like that uh, with phishing attacks, you know, uh, it's, it's going to take some training. It, it takes the training, it, the, the people, uh, for one thing, it's going to tra take training the people to not open up malicious links, okay? Uh, that's the state of things right now. And, of course, uh, you're teaching them to recognize, you know, what is malicious and what is, you know, bogus. And, of course, uh, it really shouldn't even get to that point to begin with. It Ideally, we should have filters on our systems which will stop these phishing things from getting through in the first place, all right? So, uh, anyway, uh, you can go ahead and read the rest of it there, okay? And, oh, down here. They fell flat again. Oh, here we go, uh, up here. While the kill disk authors utterly failed to earn money from ransomware, they avoided encryption mistakes common to other black hats in their use of triple deaths applied to 4,096 byte file blocks with each file sharing 64-bit encryption key sets, but they fell flat again, opening a hole that lets Linux users decrypt files with significant effort and some luck. Windows users have no such option at this stage. So, okay, well, even though the malware, the, the ransomware is infecting Linux computers, at least we Linux folk do have a little bit of advantage over the Windows guy, right? So, anyway, over here at the hackernews.com, we have a little bit more of a technical detail about it. And here's a picture of what it looks like when you try to boot up your system. And uh, the boot up screen has that message, oh, we're so sorry, but the encryption of your data has been successfully completed. So you can lose your data or pay 222 Bitcoin to this, this particular Bitcoin wallet address. Uh, and uh, you get, and they even give a contact email. Okay, so anyway, uh, but the, they're starting the article off here with the question: What, what do you do if ransomware affects you? Should you pay or not to recover your files? And the FBI advises: Pay off the criminals to get the files back if you don't have a backup. But, however, paying off a ransom to cyber criminals is definitely not a wise option because there's no guarantee that you'll get the decryption key in return. And, of course, we just saw where in this particular, this particular attack, the attackers, you know, just kind of forgot, you know, to, uh, you know, to store their encryption keys or their decryption keys. So, even if you pay, you still can't get them back, right? So anyway, uh, 
but you can continue reading there and again it's a little bit more technical details about it but down here prevention is the best practice so the only safe way of dealing with ransomware is prevention and the best defense against ransomware is to create awareness within the organizations as well as maintaining backups that are rotated regularly so if your organization has a good backup plan going then if ransomware hits and you can't get the keys to decrypt or you can't pay or don't want to pay uh, then you re restore your files from the backup and most viruses are introduced by opening infected attachments or clicking on links to malware usually in spam emails so do not click on links provided in emails and attachments from unknown sources and ensure that your systems are running the latest version of antivirus software with up-to-date malware definitions well that part is mainly for Windows users and there is antivirus software for Linux but uh, it really just scans for Windows type of viruses so the main reason to put antivirus software on Linux is to uh, prevent any files that you share with Windows computers you know from from in infecting those Windows computers but uh, there there is of course uh, there are there are of course other things that you can do in order to prevent this malware this ransomware from getting onto your your Linux systems and then in general I mean phishing emails all that they're not the only ways that attackers can infect systems one thing that they can do is they'll have botnets set up that'll continuously scan the entire internet for internet facing servers that have secure shell enabled and what they really want to look for is servers that allow users to log in via username and password so what they'll do with those servers when they find them like that is that they will perform automatic brute force password attacks against those servers and they especially like it when they can find servers that allow the root user to log in via secure shell so lesson number one don't allow the root user to log in via secure shell okay and a few years ago uh, a couple of years ago not that long ago they uh, uh, some server administrators in Asia made the news because they had their SSH servers set up exactly like this okay that allowed the root user to log in via secure shell and on top of that they had some very very weak passwords set up for the root user account so because of that you know these botnets they found those servers they successfully broke in and they planted malware and it was quite a while before the server administrators you know, figured out what was going on and the malware basically just joined the servers to the botnet okay so don't allow the root user to log in via secure shell and better yet whenever possible just completely disable the root user account on the machines and when you do that then you're going to force everybody to log in via uh, their normal unprivileged user accounts and then just have everybody set up with different levels of pseudo privileges so that you know they can only do just the things that they're they, they really need to do in order to perform their jobs okay and then also you can set up a key exchange for secure shell and then just disable the username and password authentication and the reason for that is because for one thing uh, when, when you do that the botnets who scan your machines you know they'll, they'll find that secure shell is is enabled you know uh, you won't be able to hide that if the botnets find that username and password authentication is disabled they'll just quit scanning your machine they'll go away right and that's because that you know when you have username password authentication disabled you're just using the key exchange for authentication 
then you know the botnets can you know they they can do brute force password attacks against your machines forever, and it's not do, going to do any good. Okay, uh, there are other things that can help. Firewalls, TCP wrappers can help, but you got to remember that IP addresses can be spoofed. So you you don't want to depend on those things alone to protect your systems. Okay. Uh, and of course there are other things too. There's uh, uh, fail to ban, for example, that'll lock out user accounts after so many failed authentications, things like that. But that's adding a lot of complexity. Uh, it's a lot simpler just to set up the key exchange authentication for Secure Shell and disable the username password authentication. And of course that's not to take away, you know, from the device over here. Okay, because in this, these particular attacks we already saw were mainly phishing attacks where, you know, people sent the phishing emails out to try to, to uh, trick people into downloading the malware. So, uh, so here uh, again, just you know, train your people. Don't open those kinds of emails. Better yet, if at all possible, set up filtering systems on your networks in order to keep all that stuff from getting through in the first place. So anyway, I think that's pretty much it for the Linux security report for now. So take care. If you like the videos, be sure to like and subscribe, and we will catch you next time.